Well, I place most of the blame on Keith Drury. He invited my son to go hiking with him on the Appalachian Trail about 10 years ago. And so Ethan took off at Springer Mountain, Georgia, and they started up. And over the next three years, Ethan hiked the whole trail, all 2,200 miles of it. And I had the opportunity on a couple of occasions to jump into the hike with him. And we hiked through much of uh, Virginia and then all of Pennsylvania, which they refer to as Roxylvania for obvious reasons. And then into New Anyway, I got bitten by the bug. And it's all Keith Drury's fault. It didn't help to move to New Brunswick, Canada, which has some of the most beautiful hiking anywhere. One of the top 50 trails in the world is the Fundy Footpath, and it's not far from my house. So I can't help myself. I just love to get out there and go hiking. Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the trail, it occurred to me that hiking is a great metaphor for being a Christian. What we're on is a hike. I also think there's a there's a lot in Scripture that really illustrates this. People are hiking. They're, they're walking on purpose. So pilgrimages like that undertaken by Abram and Sarah as they left Ur and then Haran and went on to Canaan, that was a, that was a pilgrimage. That was a hike. The Israelites in the wilderness, that hike took a little longer than uh, they, was hoping, they were hoping for, but that was a hike, a walk on purpose. Jesus, no place to lay his head. In other words, he was an ambulator. He was walking around. He was walking on purpose for those three years. So hiking is all throughout the Bible. There's even a hiker's verse, Hebrews 12, 1. Let us lay aside everything that hinders. Because if you've ever done any hiking, you know how important it is to only have in your pack what you absolutely need because you're carrying it. So hikers talk about packing light and right. You only carry what you need in the bag, but everything you will have is in that bag, so you better take what you need, You're packing light and right. And the passage that the Renbargers read for us this morning describes how we are packed light and right. So if you have your Bibles, uh, open them up if they aren't already to 2 Peter chapter 1. I just want to read one more verse, repeating that verse that was read for us. Verse 3, his divine power, God's divine power, has given us, has given us everything we need for living the godly life. Let me say it again. His divine power has given us everything we need for living the godly life. If you thought I was going to come here this morning and say, listen, we're on a hike. Let's make sure we pack light and right. That's not my message. Here's my message. You and I are going on a hike as believers, and God has already packed by his divine power everything we need for living the godly life. God has already packed us light and right. So what's he put in that bag? That's the question I asked myself. And the very first thing I realized that God had put in this bag is an invitation. It's got my name on it. Yours has your name on it. God has invited you on this hike. Now, that's what he says in verse 3 when he speaks about God having called us. That's what he means in verse 10 when he talks about the calling you have received. It means that you and I didn't just decide to go on this hike. We were invited by God. Now, I can tell you, I'm pretty sure when I ended up hiking with Ethan, I didn't get one of these. I'm not even sure, actually, I got an invitation. I think it went something like this. Dad, Mom, I'm going on a hike. Great, I'll come with you. He was just too nice to say no. But you and me, we got one of these. And it's got your name on it. And you and I have to realize that if we're on this hike with God, it's because he invited us first. Now, why is that important to remember? Well, there's several reasons. Here's one. Because if we know that we were invited on this hike, it eliminates any basis for pride. And we sometimes sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. What a great guy I am. What a great guy I am. Right? 
Wasn't I wise to make a decision? You were invited on this hike. And if he hadn't invited you on this hike, you wouldn't be on this hike. We have been called and we have received what you and I could never have gotten for ourselves. So there's no basis for pride. There's also no basis legitimately for disobedience. If he invited you on this hike, then you are on his hike. He picks the trail. He marks out the terrain. He determines what that day's walk is going to look like. Not you, not me. We might think there's lots of other places we'd like to go. We might like to find a more level trail, not that rocky one. But it doesn't matter if we're on his hike. It's his hike. We stay on his hike. Now, if you choose to get off his trail and get on your own trail, he'll let you go. But in all honesty, you're not on his hike anymore, are you? So if you recognize you've been called to this hike, it reinforces the necessity of obedience to stay on the trail he's marked out for you. Here's, here's a third reason why I think it's so important to remember this invitation, and that is it is a source of encouragement. Here's what I mean by that. If it hasn't happened already, somewhere along the way in your Christian walk, you will wonder if you can do this. He's asking you to do some incredibly difficult things. He's asking you to forgive people who have hurt you. He's asking to, you to love people who are unlovely. He's asking you to trust him in circumstances when you would much rather be at the wheel controlling your destiny. He's asking you to do very difficult things and you will find yourself, if you haven't already, wondering whether you can really take this hike with God. But if you got an invitation from God, then it stands to reason he who knows you best understands what you're capable of. And that if he's invited you on this hike, you can do it. There's great encouragement in that, in the recognition that even at those moments of seeming impossibility, God will make a way. He'll, he'll provide what you need. If he invites you on this hike, then he's going to foot the bill. He caters the hike. Now, it didn't work that way with my son. As long as I was on the hike, it was my credit card that kept coming out. But that, that was all right. I was happy to pay my way. But when it comes to God, if you're on his hike, he'll foot the bill. He will provide, for, my God will provide all you need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He who began a good work in you, finish it with me, will carry it on to completion. So source of great encouragement in the God who invites us onto this hike will take care of us on this hike. And he, he doesn't take care of us like a trail angel. Anybody ever heard that phrase? I hadn't either. I learned it as we were coming out of a trailhead in Virginia. It was a hot day. We'd been walking all day. And I, I saw a mirage at the trailhead. It was a red cooler, a red plastic cooler, John, with a white lid. And I knew what this meant. If that's a real cooler, there's probably something cool in there. And sure enough, I got to the cooler, I opened it up, and it's filled with soda and ice. I said, Ethan, where did this come from? Oh, he said, Dad, this is from a trail angel. I said, what's a trail angel? He said, well, these are people who live nearby and they know how hard it is to do this hike. And so they just come out of the kindness of their heart and they just leave this stuff for us. Now, I love trail angels and I'm glad God has angels, but God doesn't give like a trail angel. Their gifts are serendipitous, periodic, momentary and temporary delights followed by long seasons of thirst and exhaustion. But God walks alongside us by his spirit and gives us at every moment what we need. He will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. So if you got one of these, be encouraged. God will take care of you on your hike. What else is in this pack that he packed for me? Well, he, he packed a map and he packed a flashlight. I'm not going to put it on. I have some dignity. <laughs> and he packed a compass. 
a map, a flashlight, and a compass. He packed a map. Now, what do you use a map for? A map is really helpful when you're in unfamiliar territory and you need to know the way to go. You're out on the trail, you're walking along, there are diversions in the trail and you're not sure, which, this is when you pull out a map because you're not sure where to go. Now, the passage that we just read talks about two situations where having a map is really crucial. One of those situations is when we find ourselves experiencing a temptation, an attraction towards something in this world. The, the passage, Peter talks about it as escaping the corruptions of this world in verse 4. And a map is a great thing to have at that moment to let you know that that beautiful place that looks like a shortcut to get you to that beautiful vista is actually a swamp. And you don't want to get in there. Map's really good for that. So what did God pack for us? He packed a map. And what is this map? It's scripture. Scripture is a map that makes the unfamiliar familiar to us. This is what happens in the prophets where Jeremiah stands in Jeremiah 7 at the gate of the temple and he proclaims to the people who are coming in that this worship that's going on, that in their minds is legitimate worship. Aren't we lucky? Isn't God lucky to have us doing this for him? And Jeremiah says, no, no, I'll tell you what's going on here. This is nothing but hypocrisy. That's a moment where the word of God lays out in clarity what reality looks like and steers us away from the morass, from the difficulty, by the word of God, helping us to understand the right places to walk. This is what the word of God does. This is what happens when Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he points to the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, that looked like a, a great way of life. These are righteous people, and they're flowing robes, and they, they're honored in the marketplace, and they seem to have... To have, to have understood what righteousness before God looks like. Jesus says, I'll tell you what these folks are. Whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Do you see what the word of God's doing there? The word of God is peeling back the appearance to allow us to see what's really real. This is what God's word does for us. It provides a map so that you and I aren't just walking blindly. We don't, we don't need to be tripped up into taking these bypaths which end nowhere or worse. If we make the word of God a regular part of our lives, it opens up for us in clarity the right way to walk. This is what God gives us in his word. And he gives us a flashlight. Now, a flashlight is very useful in dark places. You run into those from time to time when you're hiking, and it's great to have one of these things. And it's great to have the word of God in those dark places too. The word of God is like a flashlight. What makes a place in our lives dark? Well, one reason it's dark is because it's unfamiliar. You never thought you would get that diagnosis. Never. And so you have absolutely no framework to understand that diagnosis. It's a totally new territory for you. And it's dark. Never in a million years did you think you would be abandoned and left as a single parent, not in a million years, and so it's completely dark. Never in a million years would you have imagined what it would be like to live with this chronic illness or to face these, this, this betrayal from your own family. Never in a million years, and those moments are dark moments, and at those moments, it's really good to have a light. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It's the word of God that at that moment's moment reassures you that your identity is not tied up in those things, not tied up in your physical health, not tied up in your financial health, not tied up in your marital status. Your identity is secure as a child of God. It's the word of God that tells you that. It's the word of God that takes that dark space and illumines it with the light of God's presence. In your light, we see light. Psalm 36, you heard it read this morning. It's the word of God that shines the light in that dark place. It may not take away the diagnosis. It may not solve your marital problems. It may not take away that sense of betrayal and abandonment, but it allows you to see more clearly what reality looks like in that moment. This is what the word of God can do for us. 
So one reason things get dark is because they're unfamiliar. Another reason things get dark is because they're all too familiar. It's one thing to get a diagnosis like that. It's another thing to have to go through your fifth, sixth, seventh round of chemo. It's one thing to learn that your husband's been unfaithful and is leaving. That's a kind of darkness. It's another kind of darkness to have to wake up months later and realize it's all on you. But here again, the word of God is a light. The word of God reassures us that God's presence is unending, that God will be there no matter what the circumstances are, that God is just as much present with you in your current darkness as he has ever been. It's the word of God that reminds us of that. And God has packed that for us, for you. A map for places where we don't know where we are and a light for places that are so dark and a compass. A compass is for orienting yourself. Really only has one job as far as I can tell, Pastor Steve, and that's to help me understand where magnetic north is. But the beauty of that is if I know where magnetic north is, I know where all the other directions are. And here again, this is what scripture does. Scripture orients.